I, I thought I might just read a little bit and then Ronnie and I are going to talk about, I don't know. I wish we could be eating food, talk about food, yeah. music, anything else. Um, our mouths full. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that sounds great. Um, I, I'm just going to do a really short reading that I hope might op open up the conversation a little bit um, from the beginning of the book. Um, so I don't know that you need to know anything if you're out there listening, except that um, Bear Wallow is the name of a mountain that I could see from my family's land and kind of had this mythology about and would, would often look out for when I was uh, roaming around as a kid. And that after I, I sort of left when I was 18 and left as fast as I could and then moved to what I thought was going to be a really different foreign place from my small mountain town. And I went into this small mountain town in Honduras and strangely, it was not as different as I thought it was going to be. So I'm going to read from a section where um, I'm first in Honduras and then goes back in time a little bit. And I'm teaching their first grade in a, in a rural school and my now wife and then girlfriend's name is Sarah. So that pops up in here too. Some mornings in the first grade classroom at the elementary school, I passed around white sheets of paper along with our basket of broken and half naked crayons. So the students could draw while I collected myself in the front of the room. I should say too, that I had no business teaching. I didn't know what I was doing. Nearly all of them reached first for the green, starting a few feuds. They aligned their pages on their desks and then with crooked sharp lines, pulled the crayons up and down and up and down along the top of the whiteness. No one, nothing was added to the page until the lines of the mountain stood firmly in the backdrop. It was impulse. We hadn't spoken about representing the physical parts of the world around us. I was just trying to keep them busy while I pieced together lesson plans. But the mountains were always first, as if the children were born knowing of the land's longevity and history. The mountains spread as green outlines across the piece of paper, always mountains before houses, before mothers and fathers, before the students' round-headed, long-armed representations of themselves. It was a strange image to witness, a room of small and children hunched over their papers and wobbly wooden desks, scratching thick green lines into an empty world. A few years before landing in Honduras, Sarah and I had set out for my university for lunch one day. We stopped in the parking lot of a grocery store to get money from an ATM. And as we did, I noticed the hood of my rodeo coughing smoke. I pulled forward the car smoke a final sigh. My college town, both of my grandfathers with their bare high school educations could likely have fixed the car or at least diagnosed the problem. All I really knew to do was to open the hood and look around, but I could talk about Faulkner and iambic pentameter. A man eventually stopped to help us. He hopped from his muddy truck with his two young children in tow. He bid us hello and immediately bent down, reaching to touch the green goo pooling beneath the car. Your radiator's busted, he announced, standing back up and wiping the green on his jeans. He sent his son to fill a jug with water next to the bank. As Sarah and I stood in the steaming, by the steaming car in the middle of a parking lot in the middle of North Carolina. Where are y'all from, he asked. Henderson County, I said, farther west. Oh, so y'all's mountain folk, we nodded. Mountain folks, good people, he said. Despite it hated my personal characteristics or shaped me in any way, it seems such a curious notion. If the land had marked me somehow, I didn't know how. I started wondering if others knew me to be mountain folk. Was I good people because of plate tectonics? In Honduras, the voice of our good Samaritan mechanic crept back into our head over and over. So y'all's mountain folk. In that foreign world, I easily spotted how the mountains rubbed the people. They had been shaped by life in the highlands. I heard it in their voices. I saw it in their eyes, but I couldn't do the same with myself. How was I marked? How was I mountain people? How was I my people? So after digging in and planting roots on the edge of Gracias, Sarah and I decided to pack it up, return to the Blue Ridge. I took this job at Edneyville Elementary School. Sarah and I married moved into a small house off Gillum Road, 
dead in the view of Bear Wallow Mountain. So I think I was cutting out. I don't know how much of that came through, but. I, it, most of it came through, but, but I think everyone should buy the book just to make there you sure. go <laughs> that's, that's, that's the teaser the part of it and i just um when you mentioned we had talked a little bit about where you're going to read and there were a couple of things we had mentioned and when you mentioned this i was so glad because um i left i left kentucky in my 20s um and went straight to the rocky mountains um kind of bounced around colorado for a year and then ended up in northern New Mexico, in and around uh, Santa Fe. And I, it, this was in the 1970s. And I suddenly started to realize this thing that you're talking about, that the, the Norteños, uh, the people who had lived in those mountains for centuries, really, um, that, that despite the huge language difference. Many of them didn't speak English, and I'm, I'm quite ashamed to say that I don't speak Spanish. Um, but that same, that there were characteristics that were the same that I began to know that sort of, um, well, I, one of the things I say about my family is I was raised by loaves and fishes Christians. Um, <laughs> and it, there was that same willingness to share whatever you have, even though it's it's not very much. A lot of those characteristics, I mean, the other part that was interesting to me was that I heard from the younger people who had moved there, I heard the same kind of stereotypes and derogatory statements about the people of the mountains that I had heard about people from my mountains as well, that kind of, um, shiftless lazy narrative and they're clannish and better not pull in that driveway to turn around or somebody will shoot you kind of kind of things and I just I um those are two different things that I guess we'll talk about differently but but you talk about um I think you called it some sort of wide-reaching mountainness right and and what did what did that what does that mean to you? What did you see um, between Honduras and your home? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think that some of it was, I was recognizing it without articulating it at first, you know, just sort of, it, it felt comfortable in a way that it shouldn't have. I remember being on these cobblestone streets below this cloud forest. So nothing like that is, is reminiscent of home, but these men on the corners who won't really meet you in the eye and they mumble a little bit, but you know kind of what they're talking about and they feel trustworthy. There was something about that that reminded me of, of my grandfather and kind of men like him. Um, and that made me, I think, start investigating a little bit. Like, why are these men I meet in this mountain town different from the men I met, meet in the other part of this country? And is there something about having to be, I don't know, ha having to make a life in the mountains that creates some shared characteristics. And so some of it I think was, um, was a kind of, uh, I don't know, a kind of keeping to oneself or kind of containing oneself that, you know, there's not a lot of excitement and <laughs> there's not a lot of people jumping around. Um, and so like, you know, clannish is often the, the thing that's thrown in this derogatory way or show, shown up in TV or movies, but there was a kind of like, tightness, you know, to, to the way people interacted. And, and, um, you know, I often told people that it felt like you were on the outside until you weren't, and then you were never going to get back on the outside. You know, you were sort of, exactly. you know, once you're in, you're in. And so that, that sort of felt like home in a way too. Yeah. Um, and it just pricked my ears to, you know, what are the other things that I didn't know about me, about where I'm from? Um, and how much of that has to do with, you know, geology and the kind of cultures that come from that. And, um, it just kind of opened up lots of questions, I think. I wonder sometimes about the fact that, that when a stranger shows up in the mountains, they've meant to get there. You know, you could be lost in the Midwest and in some flat territory and end up someplace without intention. But, but you, if you get lost in the mountains, you may be lost in a specific place, but, um, 
but you're not, you know that you're in the mountains, you've come there for a reason. And for much of our history, um, going back to the original inhabitants of these right. mountains and the first Europeans that showed up, people didn't always show up with the best of intentions. <laughs> I mean, I wonder, I yes. wonder if this much, uh, much talked about wariness that we have is, is pretty much well earned. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. 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 Why not keep the outsiders on the outside if they're going to come in and steal your stuff and take your coal and cut your trees, you know, maybe there is something to that uh, prickle, pricklish. Yeah. Build feeling. a house on your beautiful bear wall. Um, right. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Will, yeah. you, will you take a minute here and just share it? Cause I love this so much. And it made me think so much of, of um, the way I thought, about things as a child and the names of things and whatever. So will you describe Bear Wallow and then share with us how you how you as a child believed it had been shaped? <laughs> yeah, it's such a weird, maybe it's not strange, but to me, you know, I was surrounded by these mountains that are all pretty round and worn down. And then they're, the tallest one of them isn't really. So it kind of rises like you expect a mountain to, and then it dips on top and then it rises again. So, um, in my head, it was just sort of like a, a feature. It was a background. It wasn't something I, I didn't go up to the top of it as a kid. Um, but because of its name and because how strange it looked, I was attracted to it, you know, and it was there all the time. It's just big. Um, and so I, first of all, I kind of imagined there was this bear up there that it had to be a bear kind of like patrolling the peak. That's why it got its name. Um, but then I started wondering about that dip on top and, and, wondering about where the name came from and if there wasn't some kind of, you know, as my mom says about our kids, like he's just wallering all over the place. Like this bear, this bear around on top of the mountain and kind of worn it down um, on top there. Yeah. So I, I, um, yeah, I just, I had this, this sort of image of this place that had been, um, that turned into a kind of myth for me as a kid, I think. I, I loved it. I loved it. And, and I, and I have, we should note that that we are correctly calling this bear wallow, but our people we we would have called it bear waller, right? How did how was it said? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, I mean I and I love the word. Some waller. people say bear waller, and some people say bear walla. Bear yeah. walla, yeah. bear walla. Okay, I just uh, uh yeah is. Wallerin is one of the words that I have kept in my vocabulary because I don't know anything. I, it, it it just it just describes that kind of wobbly back and forth and and that super lazy kind of and also just that sense of um, um, right or ownership to yeah I can waller here right. You, you're just going to settle in and and um, take the place over. And I I still um, I, that's one of my favorite things I took from the book was this image of this giant happy yeah. bear with a real big behind, uh, just bouncing it back and forth and making that beautiful space. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I like that story. I think that's good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there there are words like that. Part of the book, you know, I write a, I write about trying to kind of wash my accent away and feeling like I had to sort of shed these these stereotypes that followed me around. But there are some words that just don't quite work. Any other, you can't you can't translate them, right? You've got to keep them because uh, something about the sound or the the way they roll out yeah. captures it better than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, I love. I I prefer the word recollect to remember. Um, uh -huh. I just, uh, that recollecting, recollecting, I, yeah. you know, um, when I sat down to write Biddles, um, it's spelled V-I-C-T-U-A-L-S. And yeah. I was, I decided I'd look into the etymology to figure out when we started saying Biddles. Well, Biddles is how it was originally pronounced. The spelling came after the pronunciation, and it was an affectation huh. of um, the British. They were illuminating the language. I think um, Randy Fertel was telling about this, and I think it was in the 14th century or whatever. They were trying to make the spelling of words look more elaborate um, <laughs> than the way they were said. But Vittles is actually the correct pronunciation. Wow. Um, yeah, which I just 
loved, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, that brings me to another thing that um, that I wanted to talk about. Um, you began chapter 19 of your book, and I wrote this down with a real simple sentence, which is Appalachia is a perpetually discovered land. And I just, I could enter that sentence from so many different places. Um, and one of them being um, that we always seem to be being discovered by someone who decides they know what we are about and who we are and tells us about it. Um, uh, very rarely to any good end that I have ever noticed. Perhaps you have seen a few. Uh, but, but I also think what, what struck me is that that has sparked for all of us from the region, this need to keep rediscovering ourselves, to keep looking for, you know, it's not quite so simple. I'm, it's not so simple as if you're creating your own mythology to come into a mythology that's been said about you and is assumed to be true, and then to try to pick apart the pieces in it. And, and that's, a, that's a piece of your journey and your discovery. Can you talk a little about that? Um, what? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I couldn't have have started asking the questions um, about the place I'm from, that um, going to Honduras, living in a, in a world that was so different um, than the one I grew up in gave me a kind of perspective and helped me know the things that I should ask about the place that I'm from. And so I think that, um, that you know, there's, it, it's harder for people and it's not impossible, but it's harder for people who, who grow up in a place and never leave, I think to sometimes start asking these kinds of questions because everything is assumed like those kids with the green outlines, you know, that that's the world they were in. They weren't, that, that was a given that those mountains were there. They didn't know that there were places that don't have those, those mountains. I just remember when I was in college, my summer job was taking middle schoolers uh, backpacking. Mm -hmm. And my boss was this, this British man who had moved here, you know, and had lived here for 20 years, but we were driving on the parkway with a bunch of middle schoolers and they all just had their heads down or were chatting and we're like on the parkway, which is just sort of, you know, opens up everything. And he just kept saying, this whole place is right in their back garden. It's right in their back garden and they don't notice it. And I was just, you know, like that makes sense. They don't notice it. They see it all the time. But for him, it was like, this is a thing that people come to see. And, you know, they're like got their headphones on or whatever. So I, I think for me, the discovery question was one of, of leaving enough to start recognizing what kinds of questions and realizing that my family's been in a place for, you know, over two centuries, but I knew relatively little about it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I knew what I saw, but I didn't think to ask questions much beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm at an age now where um, I think of all the questions I didn't ask my parents. Um, and I was very fortunate. I grew up in a family of storytellers, so I know a lot of stories, but I also know that underneath their stories, there's so much more. And, and now I wish that I had asked, go home and ask your parents right now, Jeremy, don't. You know? I, I mean, so both of my, my mom's parents, my grandparents are, are alive. My grandfather turned 90 last week. And wow. I just, I just decided I'm going to sort of schedule a weekly interview because I feel like there's so much, you know, that I still don't know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I gave my grandmother Vittles um, for her birthday a couple years ago. Oh, that's so yeah. sweet. I yeah. love that. I love that. Because she, she is my, I learned how to make biscuits during the pandemic because uh -huh. we could no longer go to her house for biscuits breakfast. And so I was like, ah, I guess I have to do this myself. So she was teaching me, um, but they're, they're interesting. I mean, they, um, they don't need to, but they still can all their food and, you know, they, every they're putting up beans and putting up tomatoes every year. Um, and so they yeah. were set this year. <laughs> They've been preparing for this. Yeah. I, um, um, I still um, string up beans to make shuck beans or leather britches. I, I, it just, and I don't even, I mean, I, I don't always eat them in the winter, 
but there's no way that I would not do that because it's just, it, it, um, I don't know. It's kind of, it's the hillbilly rosary, right? We just sit there and string up the band. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I love the parts of the book um, where y- you and your grandmother looked at photographs and um, you were reading the book of poetry that had been written about the place that you were in. And I just, um, I thought that that was extraordinary that, that you had that. And I'm very grateful that you recorded it for us as well. Um, I didn't know uh, any of my grandparents. They had all, uh, uh, they all died when my parents were very, very young, but I had great aunts and great uncles that sort of filled in that space for me. But again, um, boy, would I love to go back and just, I, I think if I got a do over instead of running around and having all making all my own stories, I would just plot myself down and start saying, okay, tell me, how did this happen? How did that happen? (laughs) But I guess, but I guess what I'm wondering is without having your own stories, would you have known to come back and ask those questions? You know, of course not. Of course not. And, and that's, that's another question I wanted to ask you about because you teach creative writing. I mean, in addition to being a writer. And um, years ago, I was incredibly lucky uh, that I wrote about music in a really fertile time. It was really when Americana and uh, ethno pop music were both happening. So I got to hear all kinds of great stuff and talk to people. And um, very early on, I connected with Dwight Yoakam um, partly because, uh, well, he was from, had been born in Eastern Kentucky, but he grew up in Columbus, Ohio. And my family had moved to Louisville when I was a child, but we came up home all the time. And his family, he wrote a song, Read and Write and Route 23 about coming to the mountains, you know? And, And it just turned out it was really early in his career and he was getting a lot of flack. And so we ended up talking a lot, um, uh, he he was uh, he's he was uh, eleven thirty at night um, in Los Angeles phone caller right you know so <laughs> I, you know on the phone but one of the things that we talked about a lot was how that experience of being a part of the diaspora of being children who were still rooted. I mean, his relationships with his grandparents were some of the most important relationships in his life. And my relationships with those great aunts and uncles were as well for me. And, and home, we went up home, you know, Louisville was where we lived, but up home was Corbin. And, and we talked about that position, um, that he saw himself in as a songwriter, storyteller. And I saw myself in as a writer of having that distance. Do you think that that, I mean, do you think, obviously you don't have to have that, but some of the great works of literature, I mean, that's where Thomas Wolfe writes from, Mm -hmm. not from from Asheville, but from stepping away from it. What does that give you as a writer, do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think there is a kind of longing that that feels like a prerequisite for a lot of art. You know, there has to be some longing for for um, maybe not recreating, but making something new out of this. You know, for me, it's often nostalgia is a real driving force, I feel like. Um, But, you know, I I also think so. I at Western, I teach with Ron Rash, who, you know, has also has a a similar experience. I think where home was still, you know, near Boone and and not where he grew up, but hasn't, you know, he lived most of his life in the same region, but he reads so widely that I feel like, like every time I talk to him, he's reading like some Australian novelist that I've never heard of, or, you know, he, he, a lot of his getting a sense of the world, I feel like comes, he travels too, but I think it's a lot of reading really diversely. Um, And so I think that there are ways, right. Beyond physically kind of moving yourself out, to right. um to start figuring out some of these things but for me uh, longing for understanding or for in some cases you know going back to how things to understand how things were um i mean i tell my students you know i teach primarily nonfiction, that there has to be some inquiry there has to be curiosity there has to be something that you're just like 
that that piques your interest and you just can't figure it out and that's the thing right that's what you kind of got to write into um there's that uh, that, that essay triggering town by Richard Hugo, where he talks about, he's talking about poetry, but he says that, um, you can't, you can't operate from a position where you think that truth conforms to music, that you know the idea and then you make your art. You have to believe that music leads to truth, that you create your art knowing it's going to take you somewhere. It's going to kind of get you somewhere. And I think that idea, um, is sometimes hard for students that I'm teaching who are coming out of academic classes where they have to know their argument and then prove it and i'm telling them like write about what you don't know like figure out <laughs> figure out what you're curious about and chase it down and a lot of times i think yeah it's it's a longing for something for some understanding or something i was incredibly fortunate that um the first editor that i worked with at the newspapers um he edited what was a weekly magazine of the newspapers and he was that rare editor that i could go to him and say i don't know what the story is but there's a story here and he would say what do you need to go get it right and yeah. and that yeah. was just incredible do you think that there i, I mean no, obviously, there is a, a different tension for someone like yourself or me who write in terms of nonfiction, um, who, who are looking for that as opposed to someone who writes fiction. I mean, you don't, you know, you, you would think that if you're writing fiction, like my fantasy about fiction for a long time was, oh, you just get to make up whatever, but you don't, you know? Uh -huh. You're right. You have to find that truth and make it yeah. fit as well. Yeah, I, I always tell um, students that I think that poetry and nonfiction are probably more closely related than fiction and nonfiction. I think it's that same impulse often of a poem where there's like some, some prickle and you're like, ah, I've got to figure that out. What do I have? Oh, language questions. Um, not that those things can't have narrative, but often that's not the the driving impulse, at least not in the beginning. And so, um, yeah, I do think there is something different. I I don't really understand how to write a novel. I'm realizing I'm sort of working on Me one, um, but I think they have to have a plot. Yeah. I realized much too late. <laughs> Yeah. Like things have to happen, right? You can't just talk for a while. Um, so so I think they just work in such different ways. And some of that's about brains. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so too. And I, the, the closest I ever came to thinking I had a key into that, um, I took a, I just took a one day session with George Ella Lyon, uh, who's this marvelous mm -hmm. writer from, from Kentucky and an incredible teacher. And she was talking about ways to get to know your characters. And I realized that if I were going to write a novel, I would have to sit down and conduct an imaginary interview with all mm -hmm. of the characters and then work from what they told me. And because, because that's how, that is how most of my writing gets constructed yeah. is that I talk to people and then the story is here and then you move what they've said in and it and it reveals itself you know right. and, and then I realized that probably was not going to happen um <laughs> I don't know if this is true but some I saw someone say once that writing a novel is like putting a puzzle together and writing nonfiction is like playing Jenga where you're just like pulling things out and seeing if it stands I don't know if that holds up totally, but I do think there is for me often like a putting thing, seeing if it will like stand or hold together. Um, I'm kind of a crossword puzzle freak, so I'm trying to figure out if I can make uh, that work. I can't quite get that, can't uh -huh. get that metaphor going, yeah. but but there is something. Sudoku about, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I I used to um I used to say that working for a newspaper and having to write in the discipline of the the five W's and the H and the inverted pyramid. And guess what? We told you, you had 25 inches and now you have four, you know, oh. right? That, that that was like writing haiku for a non oh. writer. That was like writing haiku. You just, yeah. you have to be able to not only condense, but to also make it structurally, um, structurally correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Huh. Well, is food, does food writing have a form like that that you feel like you have to fit into or is it kind of open? Food writing has been, it's been interesting uh, 
So food writing has a lot of different aspects and the territory that I have worked in is largely storytelling surrounding recipes. Um, and, and it kind of evolved from that first book, which, which is called, oh, this may be our segue into our next segment. My first book was called Shuck Bean Stack Cakes and Honest <laughs> Fried Chicken. And you can sing that to flatten Scruggs, Dim Lights, Thick Smoke, and Loud Loud Music if you ever want to, right? <laughs> But, uh, but um, that was, that was uh, sort of storytelling in fragments. So food writing often exists in terms of a story. There's a recipe and there's a story that, that gives it context, right? And then mm -hmm. it can become that there's a realm of food and there's a larger story that gives it context. And eventually what evolved for me with Vittles was that there's a vast story and talking about food and recipe gives it focus, can bring it in and, and give it focus. That's not exactly what you were asking, mm. but, um, but that's yeah. what just ran through my brain. <laughs> No, I think that makes, I mean, there's a kind of foregrounding and backgrounding between like the recipe and the, the story, right? And so figuring those things out, yeah. I, and that, that made me think of one of the other things that I thought of when I was reading Bear Wallow. Um, one of the things that I say about Vittles, so there are chapters like husbandry or um, uh, beans or whatever subjects, but I always wanted to have a subhead for every chapter the same subhead that said it's complicated, right? And when I was reading Bear Wallow, I thought, I bet Jeremy wanted that same subhead sometimes because we set out to <laughs> clarify something, yes. but our particular world is so, I mean, you wanna talk about uh, geology shaping it. We have so many stratas of different layers of rock and land and then there's a secret ocean underneath everything that yeah you yeah. Know, yeah yeah yes yeah I mean that's the both the delight and the frustration of of writing nonfiction, especially in, in the form of a book something big is that you're just constantly pulling a thread that opens up you know and you've got 17 other threads that now you want to tug on and so there there is um that's amazing. It feels fun until you have to make some sense of it. You have to give it shape. <laughs> and then, then it's a mess. Um, yeah. I mean, the, I just, I, I sort of moved out of my writing space. It's in an office building and during the pandemic, but I just went back in last night to kind of check on it um, and remembered how crazy I am. Like there's just stuff all over the walls <laughs> trying to make sense of this current book. Like it just looks like the, the fire marshal had to go in. He had to call me and like go in and inspect it recently. And I just realized I might be on a list now. He probably went in there and saw like all this crazy stuff on the walls and was like, what does this guy do? Let's put him, let's contact the NSA. Um, but I, I have to kind of put things up and make sense of them that way. Yeah, I, um, I realized for a long time I was trying to be tidy. You know, how, you know how they always have these interviews with authors and they just have these, you know, sensible work desk and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Um, and, and what I realized, um, actually, let's see if I can do this. Um, can you see that chair? Uh huh. Yeah. That's what I'm working from right now. I have to create literal piles and the process of writing is to pull what's relevant out of the piles and put it in order and leave the rest behind. Yeah. 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 And I, Someone and did a Someone did a project, this has been years ago, where they took images of writers' workspaces and let them write about it. And I remember that um, they were all so different, but like Marilyn Robinson's was an armchair like that and a, and a notepad and like, that was it. That was her, her space. Yeah, yeah. I used to have, um, I had a futon in my office and um, it had different piles along it. It was not to be sat upon, it was, to provide, you know, to provide me the piles for the projects, right? You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a weird, I mean, it's hard to talk to other people about these kinds of things, I think, but like I, the, the current book that I'm working on, I was working in this old building initially, and there was an old drafting table in there, which was amazing. So I had everything kind of like mapped out in this way, and I would move things around. 
And then um, the crafting table would change my life. <laughs> it was amazing. And so then, then we had a baby and I took, I was home for, you know, a semester and I didn't go to that. I wasn't writing. I was just home with the baby. And when I decided to go back, she had renovated the space and had packed up my stuff. Um, and it was no longer on the drafting table. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this now. It's no longer a thing I can make sense of now that it's in this box, um, yeah. which is just so weird. I mean, to try to explain to like, you know, yeah. someone else yeah. about this strange life we live, um, that would make no I sense. But to me, it was like- live with. <laughs> I did hear my daughter <laughs> once, um, uh, her dad was on the phone and he had said, so how is your mom's book coming? I, I, and what I heard my daughter say was, I think she's almost done. She's standing in the living room, looking out the window and doesn't know what's going on around her. <laughs> that was just such a, you know, uh -huh. I, didn't, I didn't realize that that was a signal that I was coming to the end. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. We need other people to recognize these things. We do. <laughs> so, so I, I know that we could talk about something, but I, we did, talk about this earlier would you play just a little bit on the banjo i love clock yeah anyway. i'm worried you know my internet it's weird i've been in a few yeah, zooms today my internet has been fine but i'm hoping it doesn't cut us in and out well you know what they um, about I'll, yeah banjo. let's do this one <laughs> i was gonna it's say either, you just you're say either tuning it or it's out of tune <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> So that's a, um, a song that I always thought was pretty and I would hear. And then um, I later learned there were words to it. It's called Whiskey Before Breakfast. Um, and so the, <laughs> the chorus goes, Lord, forgive us. Lord, protect us. We've been drinking whiskey before breakfast. Um, and I was like, oh, that's not as quaint as I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's even more quaint, you know. Well, if we had some corn, it's better. It's way better. Yeah. Whiskey to pass around right now, we'd be in heaven, right? <laughs> That's true. I, the, one of the first songs I learned was called, um, I think I heard Doc Watson perform it. I don't know who, who wrote it called Skillet Good and Greasy. Do you know that song? Keep that Skillet Perfect. Good and Greasy. It's about making hoe cakes. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> first song I um, remember. Okay. I'll play. Oh, can you play it? Go ahead. No, well, uh, I'll have to change tuning. I was going to play a song about drinking, but you go ahead. I'm going to get oh, in tune while you. Okay, you too. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the thing about bluegrass bands. Somebody has to talk while the banjo player. <laughs> um, that's right. That's right. The first song that I remembered, uh, my parents had this uh, stand-up radio, and it had a drawer that pulled out that you could play 78. RPMs on and my favorite was and I don't know whose version of it was but it was uh, boil them cabbage down um, boil them cabbage down down turn them hoe kicks round and round the only song I ever did sing was boil them cabbage down and I would dance to it and, I, and I've said before that that's probably why I grew up to write about food and music that that was you know it was all there right together <laughs> <laughs> yes so was, everything was laid out for you <laughs> well, I think this one's more of a like, um, you should stop drinking song. I think the like, I think the thesis is if you drink too much, you go to jail or you end up married. I think those are the two options if, for drinking too much. <laughs> Rather be in Richmond with all the hell and rain than to be a Georgia boy wearing that ball and chain. Won't get drunk no more, won't get drunk no more, won't get drunk no more, way down the old plank road. Uh, they're like 19 verses, I'm gonna sing one more, let's see. Okay. 
When my wife died Friday night, Saturday she was buried. Sunday was my courting day, and Monday I got married. Won't get drunk no more, I won't get drunk no more. Won't get drunk no more, way down the road. can certainly hear the mouth so voice that, that's with that banjo <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it comes back when we yeah. when we lived in iowa whenever i would be on the phone to my grandparents my wife always knew immediately she would say oh you're talking to your grandparents because my yeah. my voice would change yeah um that true. song a guy named uncle dave macon yeah. i don't know if you know his music oh my gosh oh yeah just like the full body experience of playing the banjo, you know, is hopping around and there's no way to do it quite like him, but I love him. No, he was wonderful. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Hey, I just, uh, so you were playing the banjo and it made me wonder about banjo the dog. Are, do you still have your dogs? Or no. It's been a while since, yeah. It's been a while and they were very big dogs. Um, so they don't, they don't make it quite as long, but yeah. No dogs. Yeah. We traded them in for kids. Um, uh, there you go. And I'm sure that you don't regret it. <laughs> no, they're, you know, in some ways they're easier. In some ways they're a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> dogs never grow up to ask you the hard questions. That's the thing about dogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking That's of right. questions, I can't believe we're segueing yeah. like this, but Stephanie <laughs> says we do have a few questions. I this swear is, you way I to stick to our questions. script. This is good. <laughs> Take it, Stephanie. Uh, that was a perfect segue. And um, uh, I always, this is another time where I actually, I, I kind of, I hate to interrupt, but we do have some great questions. So, so we do want to, and we want to uh, answer some audience questions, but um, thanks for the musical interlude, Jeremy, um, and, uh, and for the, the conversation thus far, uh, Ronnie and, and Jeremy, for both of you. Um, uh, Brian, I just want to comment on 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 your on your use of the term diaspora, which I kind of appreciate. Um, my mother is from a holler in eastern Kentucky. Um, my father is African American. I, I feel like I'm from two di diasporas, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and so I just appreciate that uh, that sensibility um so for those of you who were like oh i didn't know i was tuning in to hear about the bookseller <laughs> anyway we'll move well, on from there <laughs> i hate to do this but i have to I, I do have to tell a little tale about the word diaspora i had mentioned earlier i did this play with a group of women and i and i would talk about the diaspora but i kept initially kept saying diaspora but that I was part of the hillbilly diaspora. And my friend Shirley Williams said, well, you know why you're saying that? And I said, no, why? And she said, because we were all gonna die as poor as hillbillies if we didn't get out of here. <laughs> Felt that coming as soon as, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and I did not say Bear, Wall Bear Waller for a reason, although I did just say Holler, but I felt like, you know, say, yeah, uh -huh. um, the whole other, there's just a whole other set of conversations to be had, really, um, at, at, you know, so we'll, we'll look forward to some of that later on. So, but for now, um, let's get in some questions. Um, so the first one, um, what comes to mind as distinctly mountain folk? The, the questioner has in quotes mountain folk as opposed to farm folk. And the person who's asking the question says, I'm the latter, but have loved some hikes on and around Bear Wallow. I, mean, I don't know. I think that, that my, you know, the book is set in a time when I'm 25 and idealistic and naive. And so I, I, it's written in present tense. And so I had to really kind of re, re embody that um, in a way. And I think that early on, I would have thought like, oh, there is an answer to that question. Um, but I think the more that I learn about this huge region that is Appalachia, you know, I think what I was writing about was like um, 100 acres in Fruitland, North Carolina, in some ways, you know, I mean, I think, I think that it's too easy to think there's a, a kind of cultural, a clear cultural marker um, to, to sum up the region, um, which is an easy out to, to not answer the question. But I think that, that there are some things that like, and Ronnie, I'm sure could speak to this. She's probably been living in different kinds of mountain areas more than I have even, but there, there just do seem to be some, some, um, I don't know, just like dogged, like 
people who have been in a mountain region for a long time, like they've survived lots of things. Some of it has been elemental. Some of it has been outside sort of um, intrusion. And so there's just a kind of like doggedness I find sometimes, um, but that's not, that's not only in mountain people, but that's something that I feel like more comfortable saying shows up in lots of, lots of mountain cultures. I would agree with that. And I would also add that uh, when you get off of here that you go click on to Ola Bell Reed's uh, song, I've Endured. Um, oh, yeah. that, that is a song that to me it captures what is true about people who have stayed in these mountains. It has not been um, farm life is not easy. I don't mean to suggest that. And certainly there are a lot of commonalities. Um, one thing that I've thought about, I've been thinking about recently is mm -hmm. that um, in the mountains, people have um, a sense of their home place, but they regard the, the place at large as a commons. Um, and there's, there's a huge battle that happened, I think, in, uh, at the turn of the, the 19th to 20th century, um, when the legislature in the eastern part of North Carolina uh, institutes what's called fencing laws, which allows someone to claim a space and say what its purpose is. And, and you know, in terms of foodways, one of the things that distinguishes our animal husbandry, your bald could very well have been a place where Native Americans, um, uh, um, after, after the arrival of the, the Spanish with their cows and the pigs, it could become a place where you would have pastured animals and, and anyone would have used that pasture. And in your book, when you're talking about Bear Wallow, you're talking about this very specific change, which is that people from somewhere else are coming in now and fencing off their development space and saying, this is mine. Um, so there's an interesting, I, I'm not sure, I haven't followed this down enough to think about what it means culturally, but it may be it may be tied to that thing I said to you about the the loaves and fishes concept too. That that what is there can be communally shared, and it will restore itself communally. You know, you you will you will feed your neighbor this week, and two weeks later they'll they'll feed you. Um, may come from that sense of a communal space, and uh, when we go into um, farm communities, we, we are talking about fenced areas. We begin to talk about fenced areas. That's, that's the battle between farmers and ranchers and in the West as well. Um, I mean, I think the Hatfield and McCoy feud was over fence loss on, on hogs that are roaming, you know, and these uh, yeah. that kind of go back and forth. So um, the, the happy ending, I think, to Bear Wallow is that so there, there's this development that spreads out on part of it. The highest peak, though, is is grazing land. There, there are cows up there. And there are no fences because where are they going to go? Um, and now, in, like, like the questioner said, now there's a, um, an easement so that people can hike through there, too. So there are yeah. free roaming, free range cows and people can also hike it. And so in some ways, it feels like it gets at that, you know, older um worldview for, for how to kind of use land. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think there's something to that. Yeah. And that's a, that, that was a good part of reading the book was coming to, um, I think it's in the epilogue, right. That you talk about the family that sets aside the easement there as opposed to selling their land. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. That was a, yeah, that was a great question. Um, uh, next question is from Melissa. Night, Stephanie. Oh, sorry, sorry, I know I'm laggy here. I'm going to jump yeah. in. Sorry, no, I'm like 10 seconds behind. I was going to, so I know we're throwing in book recommendations. So there's a really great essay collection called The Witness of Combines. It's more about farm life. And it, and it is about like crossing these sort of fence lines to help each other that I, I'd like to recommend to people. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, so Melissa's question is, would you describe Bear Wallow now contrasted with your childhood? 
um, and Melissa saying that um, she hasn't read the book yet, but is looking forward to it. Um, and is also wondering about, we were just talking about hikers, also wondering about how hikers who visit Pisgah National Forest are impacting uh, their role in the area. So the, um, the mountain has changed a good bit. I think the book, you know, documents that this development comes in, they make these pretty small lots, like less than an acre and kind of start spreading out across the peak. Um, the 2008 recession slowed a lot of that down, but they've since started building again. And so there are a lot of houses up there. In fact, I don't know that we'll have time for this, but I did, um, <laughs> some people who live there wrote to me and asked if I would come talk to their book club because they were going to read my book. And I kept putting them off because I thought they just hadn't read it. And they thought that it, they saw the name and they're like, we live on this mountain. And I was, just kept saying, you know, no, I don't know. And, but I went and it was an interesting experience that we could talk about maybe more later. Um, but there are people living there now and there are more, more houses. Um, when I was a kid, there was nothing there. There was a house um, and it was mostly, you know, grazing land. There were some, they grew some things up there like potatoes um, and cabbage, but, but mostly it was for, for cattle. And so it is a lot different. The, the hiking question though, I mean, in some ways the, the interest in the mountain from, from hikers has, has saved it. You know, I think that because people want to go there um, and not to build a house, but to just experience it has created a lot of opportunities. And so now there is a fully connected trail system from the Hickory Nut Gorge and, and the kind of Lake Lure Chimney Rock side that goes up Bear Wallow and, and kind of comes back around. So that's a different, you know, kind of um, part of the world in the Pisgah National Forest, but there are a lot of hikers who come, you know, for that trail and that using that space has, has kind of saved it, I think. Mm. That, speaking of books to recommend, that reminds me of Stand Down, Stand Down This Mountain. Yeah. Uh, can you remember the author's name? I'm, it's I'm Jay, Jay, is it Erskine or something like that? Uh, yeah, uh, not Erskine. Or, but it's like Ersky or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Stephanie, you guys will need to look that up. But that, yeah, Patricia's on it. Um, I, yeah. I don't remember offhand, but Patricia. Yeah. That is <laughs> a terrific <laughs> book um, in which um, hikers and the and the the um, view from the Appalachian Trail saves a region up here in the Tow River Valley from being uh, destroyed to, as a quarry turned into a quarry. Yeah. So it's, um, but it's interesting because during COVID, um, hikers and people coming to the mountains became a problem up here um, because so many people came who didn't understand the pack it in, carry it out, or, or that if it said no camping, it meant not only them, but also not the 38 other people that they were meeting there, you know? So, <laughs> so it was, uh, it, there yeah. were some really interesting pictures of tent cities and in protected places. Um, it, you know, it, it's complicated. Have we mentioned that? <laughs> it is complicated, but yeah, this, um, it feels like there's just been a Appalachia and this, you know, it goes all the way back to the native peoples who were fighting off my people. There's just been a fight against exploitation for, you know, as long yeah. as people have been living here. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I just, I just was going to go off on a tangent, but we have a bunch more questions. So I'm not going to do that. Spare you that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for those answers. Um, and uh, Linda, uh, this is a food question, Ronnie. Um, of course, you can weigh in as well, Jeremy. Um, Linda says, uh, how do you think people discovered that poke salad would not be poisonous if you parboiled it twice? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and super and specific enough that you may or may not need to provide some context for the... Yeah. Um, poke it, might, spring, really it might not. <laughs> poke, is a, poke is a spring green that grows in... Um, it grows in many places. It's kind of a... Um, uh, well, it's a weed, actually. It can would be. It's also called. Is it the same as pokeweed, or is it just related to? Is pokeweed actually? Poke some, yeah, yeah. So it's pokeweed. Yeah, yeah. It is pokeweed. Yeah. yeah. And um and if you eat 
of it after it has become mature, um, it can make you very, very, very sick. I don't know that it actually kills you, although I've heard it might. Um, but if you pick if you pick the leaves of it in the spring when it first comes up and they're not any bigger than your hand, actually I think they should be. I have kind of chubby old lady hands. They should be more like a young girl's hand, right? Um, and um, and then you take it home and you wash it and you boil it and you drain it and you boil it and you drain it and then you can eat it. We would, um, my favorite way to make it was to uh, cook a little bit of bacon and chop that poke up and put some eggs with it and eat it. But you can eat it like any green, you can eat it with cornbread or whatever. And people loved it in the spring, it, it, you know, um, the huge difference between mountain food is Southern food, but it's Southern food with a really fierce winter. And so we do things differently. And that in the spring, man, we are just out there gathering greens because we're starving for them, right? Mm -hmm. And so poke is just real beloved because of that. And then it also, um, there are people who will tell you that it will help clean some toxins out of your body. I think that's the way we would refer to it these days. Um, so the question- The genteel is, way to- uh, Yes. Yeah. You know, and so the question is, is how did we figure that out? And the, the first short answer I will tell you is that um, presumably the Europeans were told by the Native Americans who lived here um, not to mess with it. And then the Native Americans probably regretted that later and wished they had told them to eat it right up. But, um, <laughs> but that, that is, there is this mystery um, uh, around the uses of wild foods and also around the cultivation of foods. How, how did that woman who was gathering this one tiny seed in Central America, uh, how did she know to start planting it in a certain way that it would keep increasing its seeds until it was a cob with corn on it? And then how did the people who had that cob with corn on it know that if you mixed it with certain specific shells that had crumbled in the ocean or the ashes from your wood fire, it changed the, the makeups of that corn so that you got the full benefit of uh, the niacin and the proteins, et cetera, that you don't get when you eat it raw, even our, you know, the way we love it. Um, so how did they figure this? And there's all kinds of, um, you know, when I was growing up, the anthropological answer about the corn was um, someone dropped it in the ashes and over time they observed that the people who ate it after it had been dropped in the ashes were healthier than the people who didn't, which always fascinated me. Like I would imagine this scene around the campfire where they're going, you know, the clumsy people, they really <laughs> have better eyesight. You know? <laughs> um, and, and so there's this really strange book. Um, oh, I, and I can't think of the name of it. It has serpent in the name. I will, uh, Patricia, I will remember the name of it and send it to you. But it's a fascinating book that was written by an anthropologist who was in Central and, and um, the Central American region. Oh, is, it, is it the one with all the hallucinogens, the serpent in the rain? Yeah, the serpent. No, it's, no that's a great, um, serpent in the... I, I want to say it's the double serpent, but that's not it. It's, it um, I always have to look it up. It, apparently I should not be telling people about it, but, but it does talk about, it does talk about hallucinogens. And what this guy says is that when you ask a shaman, how do you know that if you eat this, this peyote plant, that if you treat it in a certain way, it will give you this kind of vision. And if you just eat it, it'll kill you. Right. And, and the answer is always that the plant tells me and, and the assumption has been, the assumption by the interpreters of, um, uh, by modern interpreters is that they are speaking metaphorically. But the guy who wrote this book uh, asked the question, 
could it be that they're speaking literally? Could it be that, and, and the serpent comes in, the double serpent comes in because he talks about the double helix of DNA and how there are all these things in the DNA strand that we don't know what their purpose is. And so he raises this question, is it possible that an, human animal DNA at some time was able to communicate with plants and animals in a more literal way than we are now, and they told mm -hmm. us. So those are the two wow. explanations, and I really like the serpent and the shamans better than the clumsy people have better eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's been more, more and more written lately about plant communication, you know, yeah. trees in particular, and yeah. yeah. Um, and we know that they communicate with one another, mm -hmm. and at some point, why wouldn't it have possibly been possible that we had a knowledge that we shared in some way? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, great, great question. Um, great answer. Um, I'm realizing that it's that it's um, almost 10 after seven. And I mean, we could actually be fine to hang out for a little longer, but we want to be respective of everyone's respectful of everyone's time. Um, and uh, Jeremy, I, I just want to ask you what, what thoughts you might you might Feel most keen to leave with people about um, what you might want them to take away when they read Bear Wallow. I mean, I think that you know a lot of our conversation tonight was about f figuring out where you're from and asking the people, you know, asking your elders the things that you didn't think to ask them before, and. Um, you know, I like to think that this book is about a very specific place, but it could be about any any place, you know, that a lot of people have these same stories and these same connections and, and they leave and they come back. That's not a, you know, that's not a novel story. Um, but I think I think asking the questions, going and finding your 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 grandparents and finding your, you know, your elders and asking those questions. And I mean, I, I think I'm really thrilled that Ronnie was here because I feel like so much of her work is is this kind of rediscovering and reclaiming of of foods and seeds and like all of the things that that could easily just vanish, you know, like that last bit of knowledge could just go. Um, and so finding them is one step, but then there's a kind of like re remaking, you know, a kind of like processing and figuring out what does this mean to me? What do I give the world to, to now that I have this knowledge? And so um, for me, there's kind of reciprocal relationship that I hope people take out of the book, you know, what is my place done to me and what do I do to that place? Um, and so I hope if nothing else, that that's the kind of the, the mantra that people um, are chanting as they walk away from the book, three pages in or however far they get. <laughs> Go we'll on, Fran. <laughs> it's totally worth it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy and, and Ronnie uh, for the conversation. Uh, and the music again. And thank you to everyone in the audience. Thank you for your great questions. I, I know we could get to all of them, but I really appreciate you um, not just attending, but, um, but also participating. And uh, we hope to see you at another event uh, or be with you. I keep saying see you. I, you know, we can't really see you this way, but we, you know, we know that you're there um, and we hope to be with you again soon. Um, and uh, thanks everyone so much. Please stay safe and well until, uh, until the next time. So. Thank you all. This was thanks. a blast. <laughs> <laughs>